off with a little bit of chit chat as usual before we got rolling. This is the Pencil King Show, and today uh, we're speaking with Lauren Panapinto, who uh, does a ton of stuff. I'm amazed at how once I started looking through and finding like all the different conferences that you're at and speaking, and you're all over social media. I'm just in awe yeah. because I'm really feel like I have a social media disadvantage or something. Like I just don't get it. It just doesn't work for me. I tend to get in my little shell and do my thing. Um, right. But welcome to the call. How are you doing today? Good, good. Um, some people would say I maybe do too much stuff. <laughs> They're like, oh God, Lauren Panapinto again. We just saw her, you know, like I, I, I don't know. It all, it all kind of stems from each other. I mean, my main professional identity is creative director of Orbit Books, which is, which means that I'm in charge of the look of all the covers that Orbit Books, which is a sci-fi fantasy publisher uh, in the US and the UK and Australia kind of do. So, you know, I'm hiring a lot of artists and uh, designing a bunch of covers and I have two designers that work for me. So they're designing covers and that whole process, um, everything kind of flows from that. So uh, I started writing for Muddy Colors, which is an artist blog, an illustrator's blog, and they wanted the point of view of an art director, you know, not just a bunch of illustrators. So I've been writing for them for maybe five years. And then uh, because of of, of my position, I go to a lot of conventions and art conventions and do a lot of portfolio reviews. We were just talking about portfolio reviews. And I just saw Mitch at Artisticon in Philadelphia, which is a con where I did a lot of uh, talking about art business and um, doing portfolio reviews and, uh, you know, counseling artists on on where they can go next in their career, if they're trying to break into book covers or who they should talk to if they want to work in different fields, things like that. A lot of times people come to me in portfolio reviews, they don't really know what they want to do or where their work fits. So sometimes um, I help. I, I describe portfolio reviews a bit like speed dating um, because it, or like speed therapy and data, you know, it, you're kind of somebody sitting down and very quickly, like in, in 30 seconds, you're trying to figure out like where they're at, where they want to go, how much self-awareness they have about their own work, and then kind of give them like a really quick like prescription of like what to do next, you know, like where to get somebody like one step more. So that's, the, so I go to a lot of conventions and things like that uh, in that capacity. And from going to conventions so much and having, you know, much of the same conversation over and over and over again with artists, uh, myself and Mark Sheff, who is another, who's an illustrator, a fine artist, and occasional art director, started a group called, a uh, website called Drawn and Drafted. And we, our, our mission was to bring art business information, like our career information, to artists. Because there's a lot of sites out there that teach technique, but not a lot of sites and, and not a lot of art schools that teach art career information. You know, like how to promote yourself well, how to network, what art directors are really looking for, you know, how to cold email people, how to, you know, send postcards or send mailers, like all this stuff except technique. So that's that's kind of uh, what we do. And we, we do art business boot camps at conventions and online at uh, uh, Make Your Art Work is, a, is the website you can find the art business boot camps and things like that. So yeah, I'm involved in a lot of stuff. All over the place, but it all it all makes sense. It all kind of is is facets of the same thing. Um, what is the? Can you throw the URL? Do you know it off the top of your head where people can go to get your templates? Like I know I've bought them in the past, mm -hmm. and um, basically what they are is just a bunch of cheat sheets and and shortcut guides to kind of make sense of these huge topics and boil it down so it's very clear. And I think it's yeah. pay what you want, right? So it is pay what you want. I mean, a couple bucks will will get this. Yeah, and we want if you. If you are not making money off your work, like we don't want you to pay for it. We want this information to be out there, uh, you know, and available. So if you go to drawnanddrafted.com, uh, that's the umbrella site for all the other educational projects we do. Uh, and there's a there's a site that the PDFs are actually on Gumroad. So it's just a pay what you wish or pay nothing if you you know if you wish. Um, and uh, a lot of times people will download them and then kind of tip us later when, when the things really worked. So there's, you know, a whole, sh there's a one sheet on self-promotion. There's a one sheet on uh, portfolio reviews. There's a one sheet on confidence and networking. There's a PDF on uh, contracts and invoicing and money stuff. And uh, so there's about seven of them right now. There's one about fine arts and getting into the gallery world. Every time we think of a new topic, we kind of like put it all into like a nice little PDF and, and stick it out. And it's just an overview, but it at least, um, 
gives you the topics that you should be thinking about and like is a good jumping off point. Yeah, I, I just love those. I want to throw those out right at the beginning. Thank you. So Thank you. Listening and they yeah. want to grab those. I think that's part of what we try to do on the podcast here. The the show is just to distill this knowledge because it's really confusing, I think, for a lot of people. And some people just seem to, they're like a fish in water and they can navigate it easily. And it's like, well, isn't it easy for you? It's like, no, it's not easy for for so many people. And so I think it's great to have yeah. this little, um, t- just to be able to, to distill it down so you kind of know the right direction to go. Um, I'm curious, how did you get into being an art director and I know you probably have fielded this before but I'll give you my mm-hmm. context behind this that I was always afraid of losing my eyes or my hands so while I was working in visual effects I was like uh oh my my body is going to give out at some point I need to elevate to a higher level where I'm not working 12 hours a day on on the craft and I'm more involved in other things and I also like planning and, and that kind of stuff but for you how did you navigate to to where you're at right now? Um, Well, it's kind of baked into the graphic design publishing world. Uh, I was, I'm not an illustrator trained, I'm a graphic designer trained. I went to School of Visual Arts and I started working in publishing right out of school. (coughs) Excuse me. And I've always been a geek. Uh, I've always been into sci-fi fantasy, but I worked in in more mainstream uh, fiction and nonfiction. I worked for St. Martin's Press and then I went and worked for Doubleday. And then I came to Orbit Books, so just did, started doing sci-fi fantasy full time. But at the previous jobs, you kind of, there's a kind of a court, corporate, but there's a ladder of promotions. So you start as a junior level designer, an entry level designer, and you take other people's covers and you make the flaps and the back and the, the spines of books. And that's how, and looking at other people's files is how you uh, learn to do book covers. You kind of learn by dissecting their, their mm-hmm. Designs and, and wrapping them around. And then the next step is you design more covers so you're a designer and then a senior designer. And then at the point that you're a senior designer, you know, you're being given covers to do design of, but you start learning from an art director um, how to talk to other artists, how to tell them, tell photographers, illustrators, other designers what you need, um, how to communicate with them, how to negotiate, talking about contracts, things like that. And you start directing other people. Um, so that's what really what an art director is. And then as you're doing art direction, um, you start to have to learn more about the business. So whether a book is, uh, whether we hire a photographer or whether we hire an illustrator or whether we just design it in-house through either pieces we make or pieces we have or type or stock art, um, that's really dictated by the trends in the, in the target audience for that book like the, the genre or the subgenre, And, you know, you need to know that stuff as an art director. So you become much more kind of um, industry aware and you have to start taking into account uh, sales and marketing and target audiences and trends and things like that. So, you know, it's not just, not everybody wants to be an art director, you know, um, and you definitely design less, you know, especially, and then the next stage up is creative director, which means you're not just in charge of a, a, a bunch of individual titles, you're in charge of the whole imprint and making sure that, you know, like for me, it's not enough that a book is, a book cover is good, it has to look like an Orbit book, and, you know, I have things that that, that, that is, um, and I kind of form the idea of that with my publisher, but, you know, not everybody's cut out for management. Um, and, and it's not a skill that necessarily everybody wants to do. Like my senior designer right now is amazing. And she really doesn't, she doesn't have an interest in managing. Like she wants to design book covers and design them and design them. And, so, and she has artists that she works with and, you know, she'll do a little bit of art direction, but she, she wants to stay at the position where she's doing the creative work more than managing the creative work. Um, and I miss it sometimes too. I don't, I definitely don't get my hands dirty enough you know i feel like half my day is it's just emailing sometimes yeah I, I always make a joke when a friend tells me they've gotten promoted to that there's like a threshold and then all of a sudden excel becomes one of your like key softwares that you're using and i'm just like so how do you like excel and they're like, <sighs> you know, just you know it, it's it, it depends on what you want but i think it's um I certainly didn't know what it, what the job would entail when I was getting into things and how much management there was. And, and I, I was always shocked, I think, early on, earlier on in my career when I would hear of people or meet people who had been art directors or senior artists or whatever, and then they would step down. Mm-hmm. Um, after, after having been there, I could just see, like, well, when you can put on your headphones and listen to an audio book and do your work, and, and 
that's your day basically it's it's not so bad you know yeah. you just kind of have to navigate and find your role I get jealous sometimes of my senior designer because she just gets to sit at her desk and like play her music and like you know work on cover designs but it's really hard for me to to I still design some books from scratch and it's really it's so hard for me to carve out the time I either have to like get away from my desk where no one can find me in the office or I have to stay late or I do it at home on the weekends because you know there's there's approval things all the time and like emails and people coming by and meetings and stuff so I you really have to like protect that time um, but I definitely look at her jealously sometimes I'm like I remember when I just had to design things <laughs> Um, but I really get off on collaboration. Like I really love the collaboration end of it, and I think that's what makes the the management part so rewarding. You know, I think it I think it has a lot to do with how you consider uh, ego too. Like I, when my team does a great cover, or when an artist working for me does a great illustration, you know, I consider that you know a win for me too. But some people who I think are more um, I don't know and it's not a bad thing but just uh want more ownership of a, of, of a of a piece to say like this is my cover and only my cover or something like that then then you're not going to enjoy art direction as much right yeah i can definitely get a sense of that um so we were talking a little bit of, before we started the the recording here about um when people are coming up to you and what what an art director wants to see, and I know you had a panel which uh, at, at Artisticon, which mm -hmm. unfortunately I was not able. To, I just had a conflict with another thing. Oh going yeah, on. I wasn't oh, there's able to, so much to, going on to grab yeah. that, but or t to attend. But I was curious um, for you, what are the things that really stand out? Because um, I see it. It seems like when we're creating art, it's very me centric. It's or it's very ego driven. Like we want to create the things that we want. Mm -hmm. What we never ask is like, well, does the world want that thing? And then when you're trying to apply for a job somewhere, it's like, well, your job is so, like to try and make this person's life easier mm -hmm. in, in one in one sense. So from your standpoint, how does it look? Well, I think given a certain level of skill, you know, given that you're you're in control of your tools, you know, your medium isn't kind of painting you. Whether it's and and it doesn't matter to me. People ask all the time, does it matter if people are working digitally or traditionally, or I don't care. Like I care about the finished piece. I don't really care how you got there. Um, I mean, I care, but you know, there's also concessions for it. Like if it's somebody digital, I know we can make revisions easier. If it's an oil painter, I tend to get more check-ins from them over time, whatever. So the, the process is a little bit different, but I really don't, I'm hiring you for the finished product, the finished digital file regardless. Um, but what what I find really interesting is given a certain level of skill, because there's certainly a lot of portfolios that come to me that are not of the polish yet or the technique level yet that that um, they're ready to work, you know, at a, at a big publisher or something like that. But given that aside, that's a different issue. Um, what I find really interesting, and I, I mentioned this before, artists don't like artists come up to me all the time and they say, you know, I'd really like to work in book covers. And then they show me a portfolio that is nothing that looks like a book cover in it. And, and I say that to them, you know, I, and, and I don't mean um, that it has to be a vertical, you know, rectangle or anything like that. But I mean, you know, there are people that come to me with concept art portfolios or, and they're just character turns in like 360s. And they're like, I really want to work in book covers. I'm like, that's great. Show me you can do a book cover composition, you know, or, um, you know, if people have only ever done, uh, you know, gaming pieces, a lot, there's a lot of like, you know, Magic the Gathering artists that do book covers also, but, you know, it's not automatically the same thing. So I guess the first thing I look at in a portfolio is composition and is, and what kind of instinctual composition that artist is making. Um, because a lot, I think a lot of artists uh, compose instinctually instead of, um, uh, in a in a planful way, you know, I think we're making choices that say, oh, this feels like a gaming piece, or this feels like a book cover piece, but you but they don't know why. Um, so when I say to them, you know, you haven't you haven't done a book cover, what I'm kind of mean is, you know, like book covers. If you go to the store and you look at book covers, um, they have a much simpler composition than than you know a gaming piece or an interior illustration. They have a really strong focal point. Like the number one thing I look for in somebody's portfolio is a control of visual hierarchy. 
And what I mean by that is there's at least a really strong focal point. It's not confusing to the eye. There's not a lot of things fighting. Um, and, and the next level of that is, you know, if you've got the focal point down, the next level of is what's your second focal point and third focal point and that and what, you know, how your eye travels around the piece. If somebody instinctually or purposefully is controlling that, then I know they'll be good at book covers, whether they have only horizontal pieces in their portfolio or anything like that. But a lot of times I'll get, I'll get portfolios that don't show me composition at all. And that's really my first feedback to people is whatever industry you want to work in, there's, um, there's a certain way that that industry looks like if somebody came to me and said, I'm looking to do concept art or character concept art, and they've, they only had book covers in their portfolio, then I tell them to do character turns and character designs and things like that. Um, and the, and the reverse is true, you know, and I think the easiest thing to do is just to assign yourself book covers, you know, like pick a book that you like and not do the type. Like, I don't mean do the type, like never put the type over your piece unless you want to be judged as a designer. Cause it makes us, it makes our eyes bleed. It makes lots of blood. Um, but, uh, you know, what do you mean? Let's let's unpack this a little bit. So, does that mean that because when design is your craft, and it, these are two separate crafts, so mm -hmm. there's like creating the artwork is one thing, and doing yeah. the design is another, and mm -hmm. the person doing the artwork just doesn't have the experience, and so they're most likely not going to do a great job, and it's just going to come off. It just gets in the way. Yeah. So, um, it it makes it really hard to judge your illustration if there's really like bad type on top of, or just the the like type gives a piece a uh, subconscious emotion. And if you don't kind of, if you're not having that work for you, just because you're not a designer, you don't know how that works. Um, a lot of times your type will be giving the opposite effect that your illustration is doing. And then you're being torn in two different directions. Like a lot of times I'll see really simple type over illustrations and that's good, better to be simple. But a lot of times they'll pick a font, an illustrator will pick a font that makes a, a book cover look you know, like a kid's book or something rather than an adult book. And then it's just fighting. It's just better to see the illustration. And um, what's interesting is it, for a book cover, we're also, we're not just judging you on your, how pretty the piece looks. We're also judging you on your storytelling ability. Um, so if you just kind of make up something in your head, I think most times when an artist just makes up something in their head, unless they have a story behind it, they just kind of tend to do a pinup piece. And there's a lot of book covers that are just character pinups. But if you really want to sell your thought process and how uh, how great you are for book covers, then you should try to tell a story with that piece. And a lot of times it's easier to tell that story if it's a story that already exists. So, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a non-sci-fi fantasy example, but, you know, if you, like if somebody comes to me and they have, you know, a series of, uh, illustrations that are supposed to be Shakespeare book covers say I know what the story of Romeo and Juliet is I know what the story of Hamlet is so I can judge how well you're telling that story without having to have read that book you know um, when artists make up book cover samples in their heads sometimes there's not enough story there or the person doesn't know that there's story so sometimes enough narration doesn't get into the piece so it's hard to judge so I the, the most I think effective advice I usually give people when they start, when they show me a portfolio and they're really interested in getting into books is just illustrate some book covers that you like, you know, and, and the more popular and well-known the stories are, the better, you know. Uh -huh. Are there a few, like I, I, just as you were saying that, I was trying to think which books, uh, I feel like Lord of the Rings for your. Yeah. Lord of the Rings is good. Fantasy. But even, um, you know, anything that's been popular. I mean, you should definitely pick something in the field that you want to work in. Um, you know, don't do Twilight if you want to do adult books, that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, Dune is a big one if you want to get into sci-fi fantasy. I've seen a, a thousand good covers of Dune. Lord of the Rings never gets old. Dracula. I mean, you know, and it doesn't It doesn't have to be sci-fi fantasy. There's plenty of artists that, that uh, whose work um, crosses genre, and you can do... You know, you can do classic book covers. They don't have to be sci-fi necessarily. But if you're into sci-fi, then yeah, do, do one of the classics, you know, break out some old, you know, uh, Bradbury stories, things like that. Okay. So uh, 
I've now just like retooled my portfolio. I've, I've got one of those like cover maker things or downloaded some template that puts it onto a book. So that there's at least like one picture in my portfolio that now looks like, Hey, I, I work in books or I want to work right, in right. books. Well, you don't have to do that. You don't have to like put it on a book cover. But th th this is what I would do. So okay. you, you could be All like, right. who is this kid? So okay. cheesy, but I, I okay. don't know, you know, like, so I'm, I'm, because I don't know the world. So I'm just trying to break in. So uh, I've got my Dune cover, it's on the book and there's other, there's, and for me, for a long time, we were telling people like five strong portfolio pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, does that still hold true for book covers or are you looking for a, a larger portfolio? I would say ideally like a professional, like a breaking in portfolio is different from a established professional portfolio. Um, ideally 10 pieces, eight to 10 pieces is, is amazing and perfect and shows like a wide breadth of, a, you know, ability and consistency. Um, but it's better to have less pieces. Like if your work has recently leveled up, you know, and it's of a, and it's really taken a step up better to have less pieces that are of better quality and get rid of the mediocre ones. Um, until, you know, I would rather see a portfolio of five great pieces than of five great pieces and five mediocre pieces. Like I don't want to see your mediocre pieces. Um, yeah. because I'm afraid when you put those in your portfolio, I'm afraid that you don't know the difference or that you can't hit the, the good stuff over and over and over again. Um, because art direction is really risk management. So I, I hire an artist hoping that I'm going to get the best piece in their portfolio, but I have to acknowledge the risk that I might get the worst piece in their portfolio. So know that whatever the worst piece in your portfolio is, that's what the art director is looking at to decide whether or not they can risk hiring you. Yeah. So. We've heard this echoed before. I, we had yeah. John Shindahide on the, on the podcast and the thing that stuck in my mind was that he's like placing a bet when you're an unknown commodity, oh, placing a bet, like, look, I'm giving you a shot here. Don't put me in a jam because then I'm going to have to pull in the ringer. Mm -hmm. That's that, you know, the, the, the midnight hour <laughs> oh person that, that yeah. can get things, you know, turn around something amazing in two days because the person that you hired wasn't able to, to complete yeah. this. So let's go back here. One step okay. because it's like at Artisticon, I just thought, person after person coming up to you and I wanted to sit down and have a chat, and I was, but I didn't want to interrupt because I thought it was better yeah, for, yeah. for those people to have the time because mm -hmm. there would be other opportunities. Because you could call me. So, <laughs> so I've got my five pieces. Mm -hmm. One of them is my cheesy book cover. That's my sixth page. And what, what catches your eye? Um, like you, you've already mentioned like visual hierarchy and mm -hmm. uh, use of composition. It's in the sci-fi fantasy genre. Are there other things that you're looking for that catch, catch your eye? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just absolutely. Think, how, how do we stand? How do we, what can we tell people so they can stand out so that when you get that, you're like, who are you? Why haven't I heard of you yet? Yeah. That's the feeling that I want. I think the number one thing that stops me in my tracks is, and like makes me write down somebody's name. Like, oh my God, I need to make sure this person is in my files, um, is, someone that can reinvent the wheel in a fresh way. And what I mean by that is, especially in sci-fi fantasy book covers, we're doing the same book cover over and over again a lot. So it's like the big sword on the cover or the guy in the cloak and the sword or like, you know, like the four guys riding in the hills and the big epic fantasy landscape. We're actually recreating the same cover over and over and over again. And it gets tough. Um, and, and it's just, and it's about when you're working in genre covers, it's about those, we call them genre checkpoints. So, um, you know, you need to have the big sword in there to say epic fantasy, or you need to have the, you know, the imposing door, you know, tower door kind of thing, or the guy in the cloak um, to tell fans that this is the kind of book that they want to read. This is the kind of story that they want to read. And each little uh, sub genre of, sci-fi fantasy has those genre checkpoints. Like back in the days when uh, steampunk was really popular, it was gears and clockwork pieces and like Victorian clothes. Um, space opera is a totally different thing because it's spaceships and, you know, planets and things like that. Um, so every subgenre has its own genre checkpoints. If somebody can hit those genre checkpoints in a cool new style, but still have those genre checkpoints in there, then that is gold to me. Um, and if you look at people who have kind of come through sci-fi fantasy book covers in a big, big way just from, you know, 
maybe like zero to 60, like, you know, they'll do one book cover one year and they'll do 10 the next year. It's literally because of that. It's because they figured out a way to do um, a really standard content, you know, a bunch of mercenaries in a field. I mean, if you look at somebody like Richard Anderson, who came from the concept art space and, and still works very much in concept art for movies and games, he got really big on book covers because his style is so abstract. Um, but he was able to apply that style to content that was very familiar to audiences. So it felt, so it was a guy, it was a bunch of knights in a field um, standing there, but it looked so cool because it was his style was such a breath of fresh air. And in a way, he's almost become the look of sci-fi fantasy now, or he's become a very established look in sci-fi fantasy right now. So we're looking for the next thing. I mean, don't feel bad for Richard Anderson. He's going to have work forever. But, you know, like, you want to stay ahead of the trend. You want to reinvent things in, like, cool new ways. Um, but you can only do it half at a time. So either you do the same content in a brand new style, or you do different content in a really traditional sci-fi fantasy style. You know, like, you know, Donata Giancola can paint anything and it'll look like a sci-fi fantasy book because of his style. Um, so we can get away with, like, interesting, you know, like, it, like it, you can kind of only move one ship at a time. So you can either have the same content done in a fresh way or fresh content done in the, in the established way. So, so people that are doing... Um, the content that I need over and over again in a new fresh style. Oh my God, worth their weight in gold. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm really looking for. And what would be a way to, for somebody to see this, to look, I, I love research. And when I'm going into something like looking back, are there books that people can buy that are like all these book covers through the decades so they can actually see these shifts happening? Cause I feel like it's possible. I felt that way when I watched uh, the new Spider-Man Mm -hmm. Was it Homecoming? Spider Verse? Spider Verse, yeah. Oh. Um, the the style was just I was like so excited because someone was pushing into this whole new realm of of animated style that I feel like is so many other movies are going to be able to be made in new exciting mm -hmm. styles because this one kind of broke the mold. That, that, um, but for books, is does this exist? Is there a an anthology that of these covers that you would recommend? Or there's not necessarily. I mean, Spectrum. Spectrum Fantastic Art, which comes out every year, is a great uh, compendium of uh, where sci-fi fantasy art is in any given year, but they don't put the book covers in with the type on them. Um, so honestly, the best thing to do is if you have a local bookstore or Barnes & Noble or one of the big chains, it's actually better to go to one of the big chains uh, than the, the indies because the indies kind of tend to have very small sci-fi fantasy sections. But uh, you go to a big chain bookstore and you just look at what like you could pull 10 books off the shelf and I bet five of them will have a guy in a cloak on it so you know like you just look, go to the actual bookstore and look and if you're not close to a bookstore I mean just just search by genre on like Barnes and Noble and Amazon and see you'll see um, the trends emerge you know you'll see what kind of book uh, uses like a, like an icon, like heraldry, and what kind of book uses a big landscape scene, and what kind of book uses a close-up of a character. So you can get that stuff without even leaving your house. Um, but there's no like one printed, uh, you know, place. Uh, there's blogs that track book covers. There's book cover design blogs, um, but they're more mainstream. There's no uh, real one sci-fi fantasy place to find that stuff. I think I think it's good just the whole process of kind of breaking down and looking at historically who's come before so that you mm -hmm. educate yourself. I see a lot of people just jumping in and be like, I want to do this thing. And, and we're talking about book covers here, but it really applies to everything. Like oh, yeah, absolutely. Art, like this, this process of, looking at this, you know, what has come before. And that's kind of like your bar of quality that you have to hit. So if you're ever wondering like, hey, am I good enough yet? It's like, well these professional examples of that's your bar, you know, like you're, yeah. this is what you're trying to break into. Honestly, I will use, I will use an artist that has uh, knowledge or has done their research on, on like genre trends and content who is a little bit less of a technically wonderful, perfect artist faster than I will a technically perfect artist who I really have to tell like every detail to put in, you know, um, 
which which it helps again it helps if you're a fan of the genre you know um i think a lot of a lot of artists um want to put stuff in the art that they just think is cool which is great and fine um but they don't understand you know they'll be like well i don't want to put them in a hood there's too many guys with hoods on covers you know like that's boring i want i'm going to take the hood off but then it kills the piece for us because there's real psychological reasons why adults like people with their faces shadowed it's about uh hero insertion that uh, like if you look at ya books uh teen and ya fantasy books there's a lot of faces and full characters and brightly lit characters um because teenagers respond to the faces more than adults do. Adults don't want to see the face of the characters most of the time. They want to be able to insert themselves into the character. And there's so much psychology behind that because teenagers are looking for uh, templates to model themselves on, whereas adults are more formed in their identity and they don't want the dissonance of seeing too much of a character's face that they want to imagine themselves as so i mean it really gets nitty gritty like that so if somebody understands that or at least uh is interested enough to have that conversation and ask well why is this and if they know why the face is obscured then they can say okay well i don't want to put him in a hood but i will shadow his face or i'll turn him around backwards or something like that um so it's the same effect but a new and interesting way then you know I, I i kind of tend to i will hire thinking artists um more frequently than artists who might be a little bit better than them but who i have to spoon feed everything exactly yeah um, so I, that sets up nicely the next question I want to ask. Okay. What are what are some of the other skills that people bring to the table? Because I feel like when I had artists under me, there there were artists that made my life my life easy, and there are artists who made my life difficult. And there's a yeah. lot of different ways to do both. But are there are there some for you for somebody who wants to get into books that does make your life way easier and where you're just like, wow, you're a pleasure to work with. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep you on the short list for the next project that, that makes sense. Yeah, there's a couple of things. I mean, the, the number one thing that is make or break, whether you ever get hired again, is communication. Um, and that sounds simple. Like, of course, I'm going to stay in communication with my art director. But, you know, if, if a problem comes up um, or a question comes up about the character and it's the night before the piece is due, as opposed to emailing like a week before the piece is due or something. Um, and sometimes that just happens from scheduling or not. But people that ask questions, um, people that if things aren't going well, give you a heads up. You know, I've had artists, I've had horrible things happen to artists. I've had artists break their wrists on jobs. I've had artists go in the hospital and things, you know. So like we understand. I understand that life happens, you know. Or even if you just get behind on your schedule or whatnot. But if you give me enough heads up, almost anything can be fixed or worked out or massaged or worked around. Um, but if you don't communicate, I mean, the number one reason to, that you're never going to get hired again and other art directors will be t told not to hire you is disappearing in the middle of a job. Like if you disappear in the middle of a job with no answer, no excuse and blow the deadline, like you're never working again. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. Like there's no reason, like unless you're dead, somewhere or like in the hospital or in a coma, you should be able to at least shoot out an email that says, I'm in the middle of an emergency. I promise I'll be back in touch in a few days. I just, I just need a couple of days or something, some kind of like something, have your friend email something. Um, so, and, and I've had artists do that to me and it's insane. And, and then they'll show up again, like a month after the deadline when I've had to give the job to somebody else. And they're like, Hey, sorry. I just, things got really busy. And I'm like, <sighs> you know, um, cause I, you know, my job was on the line and that's when we talk, you know, like we were talking before about risk management. Um, so anything that you can do to make yourself sound like a professional adult, is is great and i start judging that when i meet people in person in those portfolio reviews i start judging that by people's promo emails if they write like an adult person or you know if they write like some crazed teenager you know in like all lower caps or whatever um there are all these ways that you you kind of get the feeling that somebody is like somebody has their shit together or not you know, you can kind of tell from social media a little bit if you follow them on social media. Like if they're a hot mess all the time and talking about how they're blowing deadlines and like, Ugh, you know, you kind of worry. Um, 
but uh, so communication is the number one thing. If you're a good communicator, almost anything else can be worked out. And then um, just if you're game, um, there's a lot of artists that think the art director is the is the obstacle, is the hurdle, and and that's not how to think about it. Like. The art director is your coach, and together we are trying to get over the hurdle of the approver, whether it's a publisher or a licensor or whatever. Um, the art director is not the enemy. The art director is doing everything in their power to make your job as easy and as smooth and as perfect as possible and get it as approved as easily as possible. But there's a lot of artists that think the art director is the enemy, and when we ask for revisions, it's either because we, we don't have anything better to do than to pick the piece apart, or we're just like making changes, you know, because because of whims um, or things like that, and and get kind of hostile, um, you know. And and I totally understand if revisions are uh, above and beyond the call of duty, then then absolutely you should say something, have a conversation with your art director. Some art directors are are better than others at pushing back with their approvers. Some have more freedom than others. Um, Sometimes a job just goes off the rails. Like I have a job right now and I'm dreading emailing the artist because this artist has been such a good sport. Um, and, and there's a piece in like the publisher and the editor insisted on moving the position of the sword in the piece. And I didn't want to do it. And the artist didn't want to do it. And the artist kind of made us think about it. And I was like, look, I was like, we have to do it. I'm sorry. You know, I actually gave them a little bit of hazard pay. To, to kind of sweeten the pot a little bit because it was the piece was done like it was above and beyond um, and they did it and they did it well and then the editor and publisher were just like you know what we're sorry we liked it better the other way and I was like oh god I can't. <laughs> like um, so but but I you know like I'm, I'm a little dreading emailing that artist but you know if you're a professional then you just like accept that you and the art director are in it together this is not the art director trying to like be out to get you but there's definitely been artists. There was an artist once or twice that like canceled the job on me. They just like gave up in the middle because they were like, I'm not, I'm not making this change. And I'm like, what the fuck? You know? <laughs> um, sorry. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this, but you can bleep me out later. Um, but yeah, like knowing that you and the, I think the attitude that you and the art director are a team is, is another thing that's going to get you hired again and again, you know, just, just feeling like you're in it together. Um, you know, and, you know, and, and just, I don't know, not just being cool about the you know, like deadlines and revisions and things and, and also standing up for yourself. Like, I'm not saying don't stand up for yourself. If somebody's asking too much or the deadline's not doable or anything like that, like communicate about it, like a, like an adult person, you know, don't like stew and discontent until you like explode and rage, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, I think that's a, perfect place to end was there other insights wisdom that you feel that we didn't get to cover that you're just like oh this one thing i, I think this was great that it was very comprehensive and yeah um, you know I've, I've i've been wondering for a lot of the students that we're working with who are learning how to paint like because i feel like oil painting very naturally lends itself to book covers i see oh absolutely yeah, yeah and i just like i'm starting to become fascinated by this so i think the steps that you gave I now have a blueprint. I know what my portfolio would, would need to look like. I, Don't put type on it. <laughs> I feel like I can talk like an adult human. Um, yes, yes. So, yeah. Is, is there anything less, uh, left before? Um... I think I think the key in, um, like you said, you have a lot of artists that are looking to, like, break into the industry, get their first cover, get their first job, um, their first big commission. I think the, the, the hardest thing about that phase of your career is – kind of toiling in silence without without hearing back. You know, um, if you're sending promos to, like promo emails to art directors that are on your list of like dream clients and things, um, you could be doing everything right and it could still take a while to, to get you on the roster. And you're not necessarily gonna hear back. Like art directors don't have time to, most of the time to email back and say, this piece is great, keep going. You know, so you've gotta kind of provide your your own encouragement for a while and just keep staying the course you know there are artists that i really wanted to hire that it took three four five years sometimes to to connect with the right book cover and they you know like i would tell them if i saw them at conventions and stuff that that i really wanted to work with them but i don't know if they believed me or not because it kept not you know happening yet 
Um, and I think that's really the hardest part about that, like, breaking through period of your career, just that you could be improving and you could be talking to the right people and you could be doing everything right and sometimes it just takes time. So you can't, you can't give up. You've got to send the email, you know, quarterly, we kind of recommend um, for art directors and, and keep reaching out to those dream clients and keep working on your portfolio and keep adding new pieces and, and it'll happen, but it, it might come out of the blue. It feels like coming out of the blue to you. Like there are artists that I've been keeping my eye on for a while that I'm waiting to give their first cover to. Um, but they, you know, I don't know if they necessarily believe it or not, or they're just kind of doing their thing and getting other jobs and, um, you know, and, and waiting around. Uh, and I think that could be very lonely and, and frustrating sometimes, but you're not necessarily doing something wrong if you don't hear something right away. You gotta, you gotta keep going. I guess I, that led me to have one last thought here. Sure, sure. Was that uh, when I was coming up, I never, like, I, I, we had a business development person and we had a studio. So he was sending emails out to people and we would uh, occasionally get jobs. But every job that I personally got was at a conference mm -hmm. uh, where I would just bump into some random, like, I didn't know them at all before the conference. And then I left with maybe not a job, but uh, we had like a conversation. I think I presented myself as somebody who was passionate about what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And then it led to work. And Though that snowball just kept building and I'm wondering if is it the same in book covers are you because I feel like there's a lot of reasons not to go to a conference ever it's mm -hmm. expensive you have to oh, take yeah. time and visa issues if you're from out of country um, but I feel like there's so much for going to a conference because you don't know what what can happen and there's no guarantees of, of course but how valuable do you think the in-person connections are versus someone who's just appearing in your inbox quarterly um, I think it's the difference between, because there's there's two routes, you know. There's because uh, again, like art directors, there's two there's two halves to an artist. There is their art good, and are they good? Like, are they a together person? Like, are they the, the right uh, like an adult? I don't know. I don't know what to call it. Um, are they, are they together? Do they have their 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 work together, and do they have themselves together? Um, and I can see your work just from looking at your website or looking at your, um, you know, your portfolio or anything, but I can't see you as well. So some people are very good at showing themselves to have their shit together um, on social media or through those promo emails. Um, and there are certainly a lot of artists I work with that I have never met in person. Um, but I feel like I have a real relationship with through their promo emails, through social media, through things like that, you know, and you follow people, like people follow me on social media and then they'll kind of comment or, you know, like I'll check out their work and, you know, like it develops over time, but it takes longer than, than with people that I've met in person. Because when you meet in person, um, and you have one conversation that like fast tracks, I get so much about you out of that conversation that I can't get from your work. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of the difference between like walking and taking a car, you know? Um, but that being said, you can totally walk and there are ways to run, you know, if you kind of gain the system, like, you know, depending upon, you know, how good you are at emailing, how good you are at social media, there are a lot of, you know, online mentorships that art directors, um, kind of guest teach at or like online seminars and things. So you can meet people virtually, you know, and that counts a lot more than just like a plain, you know, social media kind of commenting on somebody's Twitter feed. Um, so I, I never tell people that they need to be, need to meet people in person. Cause certainly, I mean, maybe half the artists I've worked with, I've never met in person, but, um, but it does, it does make things happen faster. Again, if you're like, a, if you present well, if you don't present well and you're super shy and super introverted and it's yep. an uphill battle to even talk to someone at a con, then, you know, maybe that's not the best use of your resources, you know. Definitely. Awesome. Well, this has been very insightful for me to kind of open the door a little bit for the world of book cover illustration. Yeah, yeah. Best places for people to find you online and, and um, yeah. see some more of your work. Um, 
orbitbooks.net is the site where all the book covers are for Orbit um, and all about our authors and everything. And we're, we've got accounts on all the major social media kind of places. And it's all Orbit Books or orbitbooks.net. Um, for me personally, I'm on all social media as Planet Pinto. Uh, it's a play on my name, but Planet Pinto. Um, so you can find me there and follow me there. Um, my website is also planetpinto.com or laurenplanetpinto.com. Both goes there. And then Drawn and Drafted uh, is the social media handle and the website for all the art business education stuff that I do with Mark Chef. So. Awesome. Thanks well, for having me. Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. That's it for those of the Pencil King Show. Thanks for hanging out. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can always grab us on iTunes if you want to listen in the car, at the gym, whatever you want. If you are listening and you want to watch and see what's happening, you can always go over to YouTube and look up Pencil Kings and you'll find us there. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode of the show. And until then, stay creative. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.